How many people brought your Bibles? Let me see. I like all them Bibles up. Hallelujah. If your Bible is t- torn apart, your life is not. I've said that so many times here. Write it down for you that have never heard it. If your Bible is torn apart, your life is not. Because every answer to anything you go through in life is in that scripture. It's past, present, and future. And it's just such a blessing of the Lord. I want you to go with me today to the book of uh, 1 Timothy. That's right before 2 Timothy. I like Timothy because he's Paul's protege. He loves that boy. To have a man like the Apostle Paul, you know, ministering into your life, in my mind, or my opinion, the greatest intellectual mind ever drawn to the rim of Christianity was the Apostle Paul, in my mind, you know. Phenomenal, a phenomenal intellect. But yet he threw it all away that he might know Christ. Think about that. That didn't mean he threw away his understanding but he, he got away from homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical things and began to preach re- divine revelation to such a point that he said, if an angel comes and doesn't say what I say, don't hear it. Well, wouldn't that make the newspaper? <laughs> There'd be some killing going on for sure, huh? Somebody said, who do you think he is? Exactly what he said. An apostle sent from God. I said this yesterday, and I felt let the Lord to say it again. You can't be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher until you become a disciple. So you have to be a disciple of Christ. That's the very first thing that happens. Then as you develop in your discipleship, then God begins to give those gifts of what I call the executive branch of God's government. And uh, there's a lot of people, they they automatically want to walk in those five ministry gifts, but they hadn't discipled themselves. They they didn't become a disciple of the Lord. And so naturally they're going to mess up. But once you went through that line of discipleship, then you begin to get into those Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, teachers, so that you're able to teach the body of Christ or preach, and it's just such a blessing. Timothy became that, he was a wonderful man. First Timothy chapter six. I was dealing yesterday talking about the responsibility of hearing. And see, because when you hear something, it should change you. It really should. Uh, and then notice something, uh, but hearing is far more powerful than seeing. I can prove that to you. And, and, and people that uh, are in the merchandise have been have, have, and understand it. You see, if you start watching television on a product, or well, it gets your attention, right? But if you cut the sound off, you're not going to pay no attention to it at all. You won't go buy it if you can't hear it. You just hear this. <laughs> now, they may be talking about how good their shampoo is or whatever they got you. But, you know, because faith cometh by hearing. They know that. You see, and when you put that sound up, you'll go down to that store or get it on Amazon, whatever you do, you know, and buy that because that's how powerful hearing is. And I'm going to tell you about the Apostle Paul. He was very concerned about Timothy. Timothy had some problems in the church. In fact, in 2 Timothy, he writes him a wonderful letter and he was in prison. Who would get a letter of encouragement from a person in jail? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. But that was the Apostle Paul. He wouldn't move away where he was. See, I mean, he sends letters of encouragement. He's in jail. Most of us would say, can you get me out? He ain't thinking about that. Because he knew faith this has no distance between him and his son, Timothy, whom he loved. I want to talk today in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to start reading verse, oh, Lord, Lord. Verse 12, we'll start there. Now, this here is amazing to me how many Christian people do not understand that first sentence. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Most people don't do that. Most people fight faith. They don't fight the good fight of faith. Now, the Bible says it's a good fight. A good fight means you win. But most people don't fight the good fight of faith. They fight faith. Like what Brother Copeland was trying to tell that man, oh, you heal. Well, you know, I'm uh, trying to get him to say what God said. And when you don't do that, you're fighting faith. And you could take this, uh, you want to title this message, it's an advice for living. You know, I've been on this planet pretty long. And without sounding prideful or arrogant, when I went into the ministry, I realized that this was my text. This was what I would go by, my constitution of spirituality. 
And yet, I would say 98 to 99 percent of most ministers, when they first met me or when I first met them in the very beginning of my ministry, they said, you know, this is what's going to happen. They gave me their experiences instead of what the word said. Now, I've had people say, well, how come you've never had a financial deficit? You know, I've never had a financial deficit in 40 years of full-time ministry. I've never had a bad year. Why? Why? Not because I got more faith. I just didn't believe it. You know, I kind of thank God that I was raised Catholic. Why? Because they didn't teach you to doubt. They didn't teach you much else, but they didn't teach you to doubt. I mean, I didn't know. We, 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 I don't mean that to be rude. They told us don't read the Bible, so we didn't. How many people my age know what I'm talking about? If you were raised, don't read the Bible, you go crazy. First time I saw a Pentecostal woman, whoop, 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 whoop. I said, she's been reading that Bible. That's what's happening. <laughs> now, the most amazing thing to me, when I did become a Pentecostal, I got flooded with the tsunami of doubt caused by experience, which made them mad at me because I refused. And they, get mad. they think it was cockiness and arrogance on my part when it was confidence and assurance. I just expected that God would do what he said. And I realized from the very beginning that I would not let time defeat me. Most people are not defeated for a lack of faith. They are defeated because of an abundance of time. When you, why are you even concerned about time when you're an eternal being? Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? An eternal being. So it makes no difference. Now, who don't want it yesterday? Everybody wants that. That's common sense. But it doesn't make no difference if it doesn't come till tomorrow. You know, when the Lord spoke to me, I'll never forget 1978, I was driving, some of you heard me say this years ago, uh, I was going to Opelousas, Louisiana. And I, I didn't know anything. I, the, the worst disappointment of my life was money. I was raised very poor, and, and I wasn't ashamed of that. Mom and dad did the best they could, you know. But I just thought, if I can just get enough money, son, I'm going to be one happy camper. I can even buy the camper. And thank God that the Lord gave me a talent that I abused and used for the devil and made a ton of money with it. Knew how to do that. I play 11 instruments. I, I can do this stuff. I can do this for a living. Still can. And even with my white hair. <laughs> and I remember when I told Kathy, I married Kathy. She was 17 and I was 20. Everybody got married young back then. Most girls got out of high school and they got married the next week. So she's a June bride. <laughs> am I telling the truth? You know, am I right? Now, it was worse with my grandma. She got married when she was 13. My mama got married at 12 and a half. She wasn't pregnant. But she was taking care of the whole house at nine. Had to quit school to take care of the house. Generations change, boy. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, those kind of things. So I remember finally I had money. And I was so disappointed because it didn't make me happy. Money don't make you happy, but it makes you comfortable while you're miserable. <laughs> Just want you to know that. <laughs> now, of course, you ain't got to worry about clothes or a light bill or whatever, well, you know, stuff like that. But that don't make, let me tell you, it don't make you happy. Robin Williams was a very wealthy. He could make the world laugh, but he couldn't make himself laugh. See, that don't care. the money that doesn't do that. What, you had, what I needed was Jesus Christ, but I never thought of God as a person. I thought of God as the Holy Roman Catholic Church because we were not allowed to talk to God. We were allowed to talk to the priest. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I didn't know nothing about faith and I didn't know nothing about doubt, but I knew something about authority. Because you do what that priest tells you to do. Especially if you're from South Louisiana, because we don't even have counties, we have parishes. That's because of the Catholic Church. The diocese, powerful, still very powerful. Well, so I didn't know how to doubt and I didn't know how to believe. So that, 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 that's rough. That's called existing or just trying to get along in life. So when I began to read this book, in fact, the first Bible I ever got, I stole it. It was a Gideon Bible. I, I told the Gideon, I said, listen, I stole your Bible. They said, no, no, you... I stole it. It was in a hotel. No, no, you didn't steal We give it to you. I, no, no, I stole the Bible. 
And it was just so amazing. And I remember thinking, I got to read this thing. Because I was told all my life, you'll never understand it. And I never, I mean, I got, and where'd, you, where'd you start? Most people start with the book of John. Keith, I started with page one. I think that's how you read a book. Okay, y'all didn't get that part at all, did you? You start with page one. That's all I did in the beginning. Well, that's, I was a beginning. And I remember getting through two or three chapters and I went, I can understand this. Now, when I got the Leviticus, I said, that's crazy stuff. <laughs> I said, but there's something beyond the blood and the bulls and the goats and all that other kind of stuff. And I felt sorry for that goat that they put the sins on. <laughs> when you don't know, you don't know. That's right. But you receive knowledge when you read and the Holy Ghost begins to put that in there. I want to talk tonight or tonight, today about advice for living. I want to talk about fighting the good fight of faith, laying hold and being committed. And the only way you're going to do that is through the responsibility of hearing. So let me read that verse again. I only read one sentence of verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Then he says, lay hold on eternal life. In other words, you got to grab this thing. Lay hold on eternal life. Where in truth thou art also called and has professed or confessed. Watch that. A good profession before many witnesses, not just the family and people you like. And if you go down to verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. The greatest gift you can, God can ever give you is trust. I never forget, when you, some of you heard me say this years ago, we were sitting down, I had some of the big, most famous preachers in the, in, in the country, if I name them, you know them, and they were talking about financial gifts. Not in a bad way. What's the biggest gift you had? And I'm just sitting there listening. You know, and I'm there, I mean, and you know, one thing, there's a million dollars and blah, blah, and this and like that. Finally, they came to me. Well, hey, Jesse. What's the greatest gift you ever given that's ever been given to you in terms of finance? I said, trust. They went, what? I said, trust. That's the greatest gift. I said, never break it because you may never get it back if you do. Or if you do get it, it may take a long time before they ever give it to you again. See, they were thinking about that money. But to me, when someone gives a donation, I'm thinking, they say, what I think of, I don't think of that as financial remuneration. I think of it that that person trusts me. So I should not break that because it's too valuable. So he says, fight the good fight of faith. But the problem is most people fight faith. So write this down for a minute. When you fight the good fight of faith, what's happening? You are fighting against disease, social evils, and selfishness. The very essence of all sin is selfishness, thinking only of self. So when you're fighting the good fight of faith, you are fighting against disease, social evils, and selfishness, see. But most people fight faith instead of fighting the good fight of faith. He said, that faith stuff don't work. Why? Because you didn't work it. And, and, and then you begin to call God a liar. I know he said that, but that's the problem. You need to get your butt out of the way. God is not in the conjunctions like the church world is. He says it. He means it. You go for it. Hey, hey, you need a good theologian to help you misunderstand the Bible. It's amazing how intellectual they can become and don't even know who God is. You know, Satan's pretty smart, but he's going to hell. There are a lot of smart people in hell. There's some dumb people in heaven. <laughs> Because you know why they have to learn when they get to heaven? Because they so didn't learn here. They just accepted Jesus as Lord and just got in. How do I know that? Robes, gowns. He gives you a gown of salvation and a robe of righteousness. If you want to know how things happen in heaven, it's the same way as military. It's what's on them. You know a general when he comes. What makes a general a general? A star. A brigadier general first uh, is, is a, a, a one-star general. A major general is two-star. Three-star is a lieutenant general, and four-star is a general. Five-star is a general of the armies. There's even a six-star. And only one person ever had it, which means general of all, all Marines, Navy, everything. Think about that. They offered that to MacArthur. He turned it down because the money wasn't good enough. <laughs> so he, stick, he stuck with his five instead. He said it wasn't worth it. So watch it. People fight faith. 
See, the reason why I have been persecuted for believing is they fighting that faith when they ought to be fighting the good fight of faith with me. I ain't asking you for nothing. I'm just asking you to believe with me. But you, but you think because you can't receive that, no one else can. Not that that person that receives is better than you are. It has nothing to do with being better. It has to do with fighting the good fight of faith. So I had a lot of people call me and say, but Jesse, are you discouraged? And all this junk. I said, no, this is the best thing ever happened to me. I got people now know who I am. That I would have never able, they would have never known. There's no such thing really as bad press. It may sound bad at first, but mark my words, they'll come back. How do I know that? Richard Nixon. <laughs> buddy, I mean, he resigned from the presidency. People want to spit on that man, right? But buddy, he came back in about eight to 10 years before he died. He was an elder statesman. One good thing about America and all you people from different countries, one thing, we do forgive people. It may take us a while, but we do. So hang on, Roseanne Barr is coming back. <laughs> Not now, but mark my words. You know why? Some of you ain't gonna believe this because we're a Christian nation. They won't say that, but we are, have Judeo-Christian ethic. Even the ones that don't believe it will believe and forgive. Mm. So when you fight the good fight of faith, you are fighting against disease. So when I'm, I tell you to believe for your healing, that's fighting the good fight of faith. But when you're saying, no, I'm not healed, that's fighting faith. Social evils, the different things that are going on today that I am amazed at what's happening in the world that I never thought I'd ever see. I've never seen such discourse and such coarse language in the halls of Congress, the halls of the presidency, the halls of the judicial systems. It's amazing how we've really went, have backed up so much. Think about that. And we're at a point, man is so dumb, he creates weapons to kill himself. You know, if we, went, we had a nuclear war with Russia, Russia ain't as big as us. Russia's a small economy to us. Actually, a very small country. We, we, we would win, but we wouldn't have much left. Because between America and Russia, we, own, we have 90% of all nuclear uh, warheads. 90%. We would win, but there wouldn't be many cities left. There wouldn't be much in America. And that's kind of dumb. To die and never see what you was believing for. But we want to use that as a deterrent. Now that's another crazy thing. Why don't you use your brain as a deterrent? See what I'm saying? So when you fight the good fight of faith, that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. I know you got it, son, because your grandma had it, your mama got it, now you got it. And God told me you had it. So when you see that, then you'll understand this. Use every resource in your power to overcome every tendency of evil. You see, that's advice for living. I'm going to say something some of y'all are not going to believe, but I really have a hard time saying it. I have to make myself. I have to get in the flesh to do it. But if I crucify my flesh daily instead of Sunday, and I'm a church person, I want to say this. If you leave a church, you, you're, not, you're not dumb, but you're just flat ignorant. Because the only thing that the gates of hell cannot prevail against is the church. And you're going to leave that protection? You talk about protection. You ain't got to understand everything that goes on in church. The pastor don't understand everything that goes on in church. <laughs> Nobody does. Why? Because people are in there. One lady said, I'm leaving this church because there ain't no love. In the, there ain't no love in the church. I said, well, you got love? Yes, I do. I said, then where are you going? You got what the church needs. <laughs> you see how dumb and stupid that is? Well, she didn't like the way they were doing things. But that's common. That's normal. There's a lot of things Kathy does I don't like. But I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like change. Women love change. They want to change stuff all the time. I come in late at night and I'll fall over a couch because she moved it. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it 
And change costs money. That's all I'm going to say about that. She's looking at me right now. I say, when you fight the good fight of faith, you're fighting against disease. When's the last time you saw me sick? Depressed. Discouraged. Disappointed. Despondent. I'm not better than you are. You know why I'm not that? Because I'm not fighting faith. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. So I live good without disease, without social evils, and without selfishness. And I ain't the ugliest man in the world. I still get hit on. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I just laugh. I see Satan thinks that you, you, you gonna make me fall over something that dumb and stupid? I think, you think I'm going to let my family go, my ministry go, because of some sexual fling? The other day, a young girl wanted to hug me. She, I said, listen, I'm an old man. I'm homeless. Hug me. <laughs> now, you know, she's only 14. I'm an old man to her. <laughs> I thought, how dumb. And yet some people say, I just couldn't help myself. Yeah, you could. You lying to yourself. So I use every resource of power that God has given me, and that's the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus to overcome every tendency of evil. I've learned to embarrass sin in public places. Because if you don't embarrass sin, sin will embarrass you. Now some of you heard this, I, I said this, when, I think in the first uh, Believers Convention I preached almost 30 years ago, I was on an airplane sitting there reading the USA Today. Y'all know what I'm about ready to say. On 10B. And this woman came in. I didn't see her. I had the newspaper in front of me. That's when you could go to, you know, you didn't have to go through security and all that kind of mess. You had your board back, boom. You, just, you know, it was great. <laughs> and there was th three men, uh, uh, three men sitting on this side. And I heard him going, whoa, man, whoa, look at this mama. Whoa, and I, I, I heard it, but I didn't pay. I heard it, I didn't hear it. I wasn't paying no attention, I'm just reading this thing. And all of a sudden, this woman, who was very well endowed, <laughs> you get the picture? <laughs> Comes up to me, and my, 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 my paper is like this, ladies and gentlemen. Boom, she hits me with her legs on my knees. And I did this, and she's right there. And she's well endowed. I'm like this. Good Lord Jesus. <laughs> what am I going to do with this, with this fool here? And the men are, are next to him go, ha, oh. And she said, where you going? And I thought to myself, you dumb woman, you're on the same plane. You ought to know where I'm going. We're on the same plane. You crazy fool. People are ignorant. Sin will make you stupid. I, and, I, and I was young then. I was uh, 29. I mean, I had my lean on. What's up, baby? <laughs> you know, you're 29. <laughs> 29 years old. Lord, boy, that was something. And I just looked at her and I thought, devil, that's all you got? Actually, I was like, yeah, devil, that's all you got? That's all you got? I said, ma'am, would you please back up a little bit? And I stood up. Now the plane's full. And then men look at him and go, oh, 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 oh. And I just smiled at her. I got a nice set of teeth. <laughs> Jerry talks about my teeth all the time. He said, boy, that doesn't get your teeth. And I just looked at her and I backed up in eye on her and I pointed at her. And I said, whore of Babylon. <laughs> whore of Babylon. She goes, ah! And took off down the thing. The men said, where's Babylon? <laughs> Y'all know that story. That's a true story. I sat back down, Dennis, and read my paper. I embarrassed sin. Why are you saying that? If you don't fight this fight, you've done little towards helping a world that is greatly in need of help. Write that down. If you don't fight this fight, the good fight of faith, you have done little towards helping a world that is greatly in need of help. 
There should not be sexual scandals in the ministry. There should not be stealing of finances in the ministry. The world is desperate and we the people that can help it. But I can understand why they criticize because you see people, ministers break trust and they should not do that in those kind of situations. See, let me say it again. First, you use every resource in your power to overcome every tendency of evil. Every tendency, everything you need. I mean, if you got to start speaking in tongues, speak in tongues. If your eyes are roving somewhere, speak. my God, close your eyes. <laughs> say it out loud. My Lord, you'll stop all this sexual harassment. People have been working for me I don't, for 40 years and we ain't never had sexual harassment. We don't allow that. Why? Because we tell people that happens. You, hey, we ain't gonna play a game with you, you gone. Come on. Come on. And then if you, if you made a sexual comment to a woman and she mad, we gonna tell her husband. Then you really gone. <laughs> That'll shut people up, buddy. If you don't fight this fight, you have done little towards helping a world that's greatly in need of help. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. You fight this good fight of faith, boy. That's called fight. Come on, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm tired. Tired ain't got a thing to do with it. I've been traveling most of my adult life. In fact, some people say dumb things. Have you lived in New Orleans all your life? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I'm still, I'm still going. Now, I prefer to move to Texas. I love Texas. I do. I married Kathy and three days later, we were in Texas. I bought my first pair of boots. I wanted to be a cowboy. But it's hard to put an alligator in a cowboy's outfit. I'm a Cajun from South Louisiana. And I don't know, I can't talk like how y'all know it. I said, what's that thing in your lip? Well, that's just a, something that, a, 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 between my cheek and my gum. I thought it was bubble gum till they spit. I said, that ain't bubble gum. I didn't know anything about that. What I'm saying is, is this is advice for living. The only way you get it is by hearing, is that we got to fight this good fight of faith. I don't lay down, people. I don't back up on nothing. I don't mean that pridefully. I'm not trying to man up. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I create my world. I don't let the world be created around me. I create my world and then I walk in it. My daughter tells me that all the time. Daddy, everything you ever touch prosper. You know why? Because I know what's coming. Because I created that world and then I stepped in it and started walking toward it. And I created it with the word of the living God. So when they told me when I first went to the mission, now you get, you get ready to suffer. And I did suffer for Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus' fault. They were stealing the money. It didn't make no difference to me. The devil thought if I didn't eat, I would quit preaching. So I had forced fast put upon me. We fasting this week. I ran out of gas many times going home. Now you can understand, I'm making money coming up. I'm a hand over fist. Gave it all away. Lock, stock, and barrel. Twice me and Kathy did that. Not bragging on that because we thought you can't have money if you're a Christian because nobody was preaching prosperity. Nobody could get saved if Billy Graham started preaching salvation. People couldn't get healed until old Robert started preaching healing. People couldn't get blessed until Kenneth Copeland started preaching prosperity. You can't have faith for something that hadn't been preached to you. Because faith cometh. Amen. And it comes by hearing. So this advice for living, he said, Timothy, fight. Not the man. Not the person. The good fight of faith because the world needs you, Timothy. Now, a lot of times you may not think the world needs you, but they do, especially if you're born again. You understand what I'm saying? He said, you fight the good fight of faith. Then in that next verse, he says, lay hold, grab something. Remember, you got two, you got two hands, do something with it. Your eternal, lay hold, he says on that, your eternal life is far more important, write it down, than what you possess in this life. You know, I have a beautiful home. People talk about my home all the time, but it's not going to heaven. In fact, God's going to burn it down. Kathy, he's going to burn your house down. 
He's going to burn yours too. Everything we possess. You see this ring? He's going to melt it. He's going to destroy this place. He's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. Why? No stain of sin on it. So I don't care how nice you live, God's going to burn it down. Let me say it again. Your eternal life is far more important than what you possess in this life. Look what verse 12 says. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. Now there's something there. So you, it's way more important than what I possess in life. But yet before I was saved, I thought possessions made me happy. Right? They didn't make me happy. I had what the world want. Fame, fortune as a young man. Women by the thousands. I'm not bragging on that because that's the rock world. That's the way it is. It really makes you something. Now, nah, yeah, you ain't going to remember half of it because you're so drugged up, you don't know what's going on. But when I got born again, all these possessions, and I still have nice things, don't misunderstand me, but they're not as, they're nowhere near the importance of my eternal life. You see, let me say it again. Your eternal life is far more important than what you possess in this life. Write this down. You will never be satisfied by material things, no matter how numerous they are. Got to have another car. Gotta, and nothing wrong with car. Nothing wrong with this stuff. But my point is, you, if you're trying to satisfy yourself with stuff, it won't work. You will never be satisfied by material things. So no matter how numerous, no matter how numerous they are, you can only drive one car at a time. You can only fly one plane at a time. If that's what you like, you know what I'm saying? To me, these are just tools, as far as I'm concerned. If you talk to the people that work for me, and I, they will tell you the kind of man I am. I'm not impressed about a lot of things that most people are impressed by. Now, I love artwork. I am an art collector. I don't know how I got that, because we didn't have enough money to buy a banana growing up as a kid. We had plastic curtains. Anybody ever had plastic curtains? Hold your hand up. You had, you had plastic curtains. How many of y'all had sheets on your windows? Hold your hand up. Be honest. Yeah. You come a long way, baby. Sheets on your windows. Right? However, but you know, I know pretty, much, pretty good about artwork. Oh, son. I mean, I mean, and, and the antique people, the way they said, that man knows his business. Well, I was taught by Mr. Mannheim. He looked at me and he liked me. Old Jewish man in New Orleans. He liked me. I believe he's in heaven. I believe in God he is. And I told him, I said, one day I'm going to build a house like, the, like gone with the wind. He said, well, you need to start buying now. Now, when I first thought that, I thought, well, he just, you know, he, just, he wants to sell me. No, no. He liked me. He said, I'm going to teach you these things. In fact, I mean, Rick, remember when I, I went to Moscow. Rick and Denise were so kind. They suggested you got a couple of days. I said, no, man, I don't. I said, no, I don't care if I'm in Moscow. Get on the plane, fly back to America. We're going home. But St. Petersburg, he said, I'd like to take you to St. Petersburg. Y'all remember? Y'all took me to Catherine the Great's castle. Oh, Lord. I thought, man, Catherine knew her stuff. <laughs> I'm walking through that stuff and, and Rick's throwing everything. I'm just looking like this. And, and I wanted to go behind this wall. Oh, Lord. The people go, where you going? I wanted to see how they did the architecture from behind. See, it's behind. If you really want a good Persian rug, you don't look at the top, you turn it over. Turn it over. Count the knots. Best ones, blood dies. Now, you're going to pay a lot of money for that, but it's going to go up in value. So I said, and that man said, what you doing? And I told him, I said, I just wanted to see this. And I, was, I said, I was looking at this piece. I said, that's mercury gilding. Ooh, you know something about that. I said, yes, sir. They don't do that no more now. But that's against the law because mercury is poison. Remember when we was kids, they let us play with mercury? Craziest thing in the world. That'll kill you. There, there are people in grave, mercury, which means it never loses its shine. There are people in graveyards that did it way back when, all this beautiful gold thing you see in Versailles and the Hermitage and all those kind of different, I mean, that's all done by mercury. And I remember Rick said, I didn't know that. I said, hey, Rick, let me show you this. Well, that's what Mr. Mannheim began, and I began to listen, see, because I wanted to collect some things. So we started out. And I have a phenomenal collection. I don't mean that privately. I do. I like it. But it ain't going to heaven. It's not good enough. Raphael's paintings are not good enough. 
The La Pieta by Michelangelo. If you've been to the Vatican, you can see it. It's like Mary just holding Jesus and it's made out of Carrera marble. And it, it ain't making it. Wait till you see what God puts. Oh, Lord. But you'll never be satisfied by those things, no matter how numerous they are. Why? Because you have to lay hold every day on your eternal life constantly. What makes you so happy? Going to live forever. I've had doctors tell me, man, you know, you look good for a man your age. I said, well, I feel good. He said, man, it's amazing how much energy you have. I said, well, the Lord's been good. He said, who? I said, the Lord. The Lord's been good. I said, you don't know the Lord? Oh, I'm a Christian. I said, that don't mean nothing. Do you know the Lord? <laughs> Satan goes to Christian churches more than Christians do. <laughs> he never misses Wednesday night. Do you? <laughs> you can see what it hits. People go. <laughs> he never missed church. <laughs> now, very disciplined. I said, you don't know the Lord? Uh, they get nervous, you see. He said, well, normally I don't talk about politics and religion. I said, neither do I. I'm talking about fellowship and relationship. I said, you're a doctor, right? He said, yes, I am. I said, so am I. He said, you are. I said, I'm a doctor of divinity. Doctors can talk to each other, can't they? Yeah. I said, sit down. Let me analyze you. <laughs> Boy, I mean, I had tears. I remember that time I, had <laughs> I went to a cardiologist when I was 36 years old because uh, I own a few things in the <laughs> insurance company said, we got to make sure this boy is healthy because if he dies, it's going to cost us an arm and a leg to replace all. So I went. I walked in there and that crazy doctor, he was a nice man, but he was just 72 and I thought that was real old then. <laughs> 72, can he walk? <laughs> you know, I just, no, he can't, I'm 72. So I'm just standing there and you know, they make you sit on them, on, on, on them, uh, them, them, them little, co uh, what do they call it, like, like a little couch with some paper on it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I looked at him and he says, uh, you know, I, I gotta get, do a bunch of tests on you for the insurance company. I said, that's fine, go ahead. So they did all that stuff. Well, I got to talking to him. I said, you know, I said, uh, I said, you know Jesus? He said, what? I see, he said, I said, you know Jesus? He said, I'm Catholic. I said, I didn't ask you where you went. Do you know Jesus? Well, I know about him, I, I, I know of him. I said, would you like to know him? Ooh, he starts sweating. <laughs> he forgot to give me a cardio, a electrocardiogram. <clears throat> He said, oh, we finished with you, you can go. I made him nervous, I knew that. <laughs> but I knew I was coming back. Why? Because I'm gonna see where my seed, if it's growing. I planted that, Keith, I'm gonna come back to this day. And I knew it. I didn't say nothing, I let him forget it. Sure enough, it was the next day, uh, they called my office and said, Reverend, you need to, Dr. Dr. Planters, you need to come back. We have to do that cardiogram. So I went back like that. <laughs> he said, lay down, and he pushed this thing on my foot. I said, Doc, my heart's here. He put those little stickers. And, that's, and the nurses, man, I got hair on my chest. But you see, they're so used to plucking eyebrows and ripping hair off their bodies. They don't realize a man cannot handle that. A man ain't gonna rip his eyes. I ain't doing that. And she goes, I'm like, whoa, mama, whoa, control yourself. She said, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I had three red splotches with no hair in them. <laughs> that hurts. Men don't do that. I said, Doc, you don't look well. I'm at the doctor. He says, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't feel good. I said, I want to pray for you. R really? I said, yes, sir. At the Homer Medical Surgical Clinic was where that was. I said, now sit down, Doc. Sit on that paper. See how that feels? <laughs> It was a great day. I laid here. I said, Jesus. I said it loud. Jesus. <laughs> man, the nurses come running. <laughs> hey, man, they open up the door and the doc goes. <laughs> they walk out. I prayed for him. I saw when the Holy Ghost hit him. He went, oh. I said, it's feeling good. He said, do it one more time. I said, well, I got it. I got it. Man, I got it. So I put my hand on his knees. Because he's 72. I thought, my God, they must not work. How can he walk? He's 72. You know? I'm just praying for him. My Lord. He says, I feel wonderful. 
He said, you're the first person ever told me about Jesus in over 40 years of medical practice. I said, well, doc, you have a great day. He says, I believe I will. Thank you, Reverend. I said, good. Just call me Jesse. He said, well, thank you. I left. He forgot something else. I had them all disturbed. I had to fill out something. I didn't. So they called me back. I thought, how many times am I going to this place? And so I walked in. The place is full, ladies and gentlemen. When I say full, people standing I don't know, oh, like this, you know, people all in the seats and stuff. And this man next to me, he says, you got a long wait, man. I said, not me. Not me. Oh, you know these people? I said, well, you know, I, I, was, I came here for physical and all kinds of stuff. No, I don't know them that well. I said, but hey, I don't wait long for nothing. He goes, And you know how they do those little windows at the reception, you know, in the doctor's office? Evidently, the doctor must have heard my voice. He said, is, there, is Reverend DePlanet out there? B bring him in right now. Then they said, Reverend DePlanet, would you come right now? And I looked at him and went. <laughs> I just walked in. It was great, Dennis. It was a blessing. Glory to God. He said, I need to talk to you. Grab me by the arm. Pulls me in. He said, you know what I did after you prayed for me? I said, what? He said, I went home and ate some red beans and rice and sausage. He said, it's always been my favorite meal, but I never could eat it because I had a bad stomach. He said, I ate a whole plate. He said, I ate a whole link. And that was last night. And I'm feeling great. I said, but well, they say that's not healthy. Yeah, I said that too, but I don't care. <laughs> he said, I didn't realize how good that was. Good Lord. I said, Dr. Lord healed you. He started teasing. I said, the Lord healed you. I said, you in, you in God's profession. I said, you a healer. You, yeah, I never thought of it like that. I said, you a healer. Now that you got Christ in you and you heal, think about when you, when, you, when, when you put your hands on people. I said, pray for them a little bit. He said, yeah. He said, you know, people listen to what I say. <laughs> ah. I said, boy, you in the right place at the right time, doc. All he was doing was grabbing that eternal life. Yeah. And he changed his physical life. Yeah. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? So you'll never be satisfied. And this man was wealthy. Never be satisfied with material things. Let me go to this next point. You must have a positive statement concerning what you believe to the end of your life. You can't flip flop on what you believe. And a lot of people do that. They're looking for the next uh, powerful message to preach. What's the next doctrinal thing we're going to go with? No, no. You must have a positive statement. This is laying hold on eternal life. You must have a positive statement concerning what you believe to the end of your life. To the end of it. What I'm believing today, I will believe if Jesus tells to my dying day. I hadn't changed. I read the book. I took it at face value. I'm a textualist. That's what he said. That's what we're going to do. Now, sometimes I didn't want to, but it has nothing to do with that. I rebuke my own self. Why? I'm fighting a good fight of faith. That's good advice for living. I'm laying hold on eternal life. That's good advice for living. And I got that through hearing of the word of God. And I, I mean, you got to understand people. I am a Cajun boy. And, I, and yet I have some of the biggest people, intellectual, and they're way smaller than me. But when it comes to finance, they like how I think. They like, I don't mean they're private, they like how I think. Because you see, I don't think, I don't think negative. When I make an investment, I'm not thinking, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my money back. Well, good Lord, that's dumb. Because if you want your money back, why don't you keep it back? I don't want to get my money back. I want to make money. I want to just get it back. If you want it back, keep it back. But what are you willing, are you willing to research what you're about ready to put? You got to research now. There's some work involved in this. This ain't just saying this stuff. It's working it, see. And then looking at different things and begin to analyze. That's one of my weaknesses I got to watch. I like Wall Street. Oh, Jesus. Good God about it. Give me $5 and let me see what I can do with this. And the Lord said, be careful with that. I didn't call you to do that. I said, I call you to preach this gospel. Be careful with that, Jesse. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's stimulating. They say, oh, that stock, that's 10 cents. That won't go, oh, okay. Let's see what we, let's see what we got. Because I realize, let me just give you a little hint. 
If you want to be successful in the financial rent, find out what the world needs. I told that to the people in the Solomon Islands. In fact, Barry Tubbs said, Jesse, that, that's a revelation. Jerry said, good God. I said, you know, God is in the names. But in one name, you can't even, you can't even utter. It has no vowels in it. It, it sounds like this. The way it's originally spelled, no vowel. Can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't utter it. And, I, and, and, and the Guadalcanal, that's a very poor place. It's like a third world country. And I got up and bought a prime, the deputy prime minister loved it. I said, you know, he said, you know, we go broke two or three times in four or five years, and all kind of, very poor people. I said, why did God name your nation the Solomon Islands? They went, what? I caught that right away. I said, the richest man in the world was Solomon and no one will ever be richer. Now this guy that owns Amazon, he's at about 125 billion. He's doing pretty good, but that's nothing compared to Solomon. You gotta understand, Solomon's got a, a whole staff of people counting gold 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He ain't got time to count the silver, so he throw it away. I'd have been in his garbage dump, been me. <laughs> Making me some sterling silver, Lord Jesus. I said, why did they name it the Solomon Islands? They all got quiet. I said, what is here that the world needs? It's in the name. What is in the Solomon Islands that the world has such a great shortage of? But their eyes got this big. I said, that's a hint to you that God put something here. You got to find it and you won't find it with your intellectual activity. You won't find it with your range and research. You won't find it with your induction and reason. You'll find it before the throne of the most high God and he'll speak to you. I had a wonderful old Jewish man. I, I also invest in diamonds and real estate and oil and uh, you know, all kinds of great stuff. And I like and, and diamonds because you make some money on this stuff. But I never forget this. Uh, 13 years old. I had this old Jewish jeweler. He said, Jesse, I want to show you something God made. And he put out this phenomenal diamond. He said he had it in the earth for millions and billions of years. He put pressure on it. And he got the black carbon spots out. Then he got the, he got the white carbon spots out. Then he took the feathers out. Look at this, Jesse. God made this. I said, hmm. Maybe I ought to invest in the things that God made. But you got to know what you're doing. You get ripped. I don't forget, Leroy Thompson is a great friend of mine. He, he said, yeah, you know a lot about jewelry. And I want you to come with me. I want to buy, you. I want to buy a, 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 a nice ring. I said, Leroy, do you want an investment stone or do you want a stone that you just wear all your life? He said, what's the difference? I said, an investment stone is going to go up. Most of them will land up in safe deposit boxes. You don't wear them very often. And then when it gets to the right price, you sell it. Or if you want, you can put it in a nice piece of jewelry. Which I said, now it's going to be way higher. I said, on a diamond, a one carat perfect stone is worth, whoo, because they're very few. Way more than a 10 carat, 15 carat, that you can't see with your eye, the flaws. Internally flawless. There's flawless, then there's internally flawless. Jesus. He said, so I, we got to the prices. He said, oh, uh, yeah, let, let's just get us a nice ring. <laughs> I said, I understand. Because yeah, you're talking big money here. But I, it's, it's going to pay off. Not today. Well, you mock my words. You know what makes something expensive? What makes something that's worth so much? It's when it's rare. Now, what does the Solomon Islands have that's rare? but they're not looking for it, but they are now. I said, you won't find it. Just running up and down the mountains. You'll find it before the throne of God. See, you must have a positive statement concerning what you believe to the end of your life. Then he says in verse 20 of first Timothy six, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Now, are you committed? First, you fight the good fight of faith. You lay hold of eternal life. Then you must be committed. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. What does that mean? Write this down. What you have been given must be passed on. Unimpaired to the following generations. 
We are trustees of the faith and trust. Every man's work must be a continuation. Let me say it again. What you have been given must be passed on. Unimpaired. Don't pass it on with flaws. To the following generations. Because you remember this, you are a foundation for the next generation. That's what Jerry is doing with his grandchildren and his children. A trust fund. He's leaving him something for the next generation. But he's, he and Carolyn are still here. They're going to be here for a long time. That's not the issue. The issue is it's got to be carried on. And not only the, is his physical substance, her physical substance carried on, now the ministry is carried on. Terry and Jerry are now preaching. What's the grandkids going to do? Who? Unimpaired. That's why y'all love your daddy so much because you know he's an honorable man. He gave you something unimpaired. Oh, to God, that'll preach the horns off of Billy Goat. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I tell my daughter Jody and my, and my granddaughter Meredith, listen to your grandfather Meredith because what this is jewels of great price. I, I believe in Jesus coming in my lifetime, but if he don't, I'm going to hand this thing unimpaired with a foundation you can build anything on it. That's committed. Let me say it again. What you have been given must be passed on unimpaired to the following generations. We are trustees of this faith and trust. On the board of directors of Kenneth Copeland Ministries, what we are actually is more than a board of director. We're trustees, not only of KCM, but trustees of Kenneth and Gloria and their family and all these other things. It's a great thing when people trust you. Because it's not given, it's earned. It's a track record that people can easily follow. Write this down. Never play fast with values. You're committed here. You never play fast with values. Any wavering, indifference, or disregard not only affects you, but it affects countless others. You notice I write better than I talk. These are my points. Let me say it again. Never play fast with values. I refuse to throw away my ministry because of a moral failure. That's playing fast with values. Or indifference. Or disregard. Let me say it again. Never play fast with values. Any wavering, indifference, or disregard not only affects you, but it affects countless others. There's some people not going to church no more because of the PTL scandal. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good of the Jimmy Swaggart scandal. Now, I believe they repented. Don't misunderstand. I understand. That. But you see, the world hadn't forgot that. That's playing fast. You can't do that. Now, I believe they're forgiven. Don't misunderstand me. My God, I mean, you know, I, I really believe they are. That's not the issue. My issue is this. I don't want that kind of track record. I don't want that in my portfolio of Christianity. Whew. Because it affects countless others. You see? You're dealing with something so precious. You know what I like about Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, Keith and Phyllis Moore, Jerry and Carolyn Savelle, uh, Veronica and Bill Winston, and Creflo and his wonderful wife, Taffy. Like precious faith. You didn't get that. Listen to me. It's not, it's not, it has anything to do with friendships. Like precious faith. So I don't play fast with values. I'm not wavering. I'm not indifferent or, or disregard because it affects many others. Not too long ago, I, <laughs> normally I get up, I, 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 you know, I, I'm just up. I don't sleep a lot. I sleep anywhere from four to six hours and I'm out the bed, you know. My mind's cooking. Da, 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 da. Sometimes I got to shut it down. Well, Kathy got up before me. Now I got a beautiful dining room with some phenomenal stuff in it. We have mice and vases and all kinds. Of, I mean, this is some fine stuff. Well, I hear this boom. But I never paid attention to that. I thought, well, they might be doing something on the Mississippi River. I live on the Mississippi River. I have a plantation home on the Mississippi River. Not afraid to say it. You didn't pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I get up. I come walking. I notice Kathy like this. She says, Jesse, when she says that, I know something is wrong. She says, Jesse. I said, what? She said, I broke a vase. Where was the vase at? It's in the dining room. Jesus. But I have four in there. I said, what vase? And I was praying, oh, Jesus, not, don't let it be the mice. You know, the ones I found that was behind glass a hundred years. <laughs> that is perfect. In fact, Denise saw it. She says, can I touch it? Then he goes, whoo, it's valuable. But she broke one that was on the, what you call that thing that you put uh, on the dining room? Buffet. The buffet. That's very expensive too. We had two of them. She said, Jesse, she said, it was Christmas. She said, I was just, after Christmas, she said, I was pulling the, that green stuff they put, for, they, they decorate my house. And I said, you notice when I pick those things up, I pick them up. And I bring them and I put them on the dining room table before we take anything else off. Because this is very bad. She said, I said, well, we're just going to have to buy some more. She said, you're not mad? I said, no. Why should I be mad? It's in pieces on the floor. <laughs> she said, and you know, she took them pieces and she started gluing it all together. <laughs> but I had one more and I thought, hmm. I said, you know, there's a pair of something I want. Get in the car. We're going. She said, what? I said, get in the car. Woman, go down. And we went down there, buddy, and I found these two. That's even better than what she broke. <laughs> and so I took the one, and I put it on another piece of furniture, and, I put, and they look better. She said, you're not mad? I said, no. I wasn't mad. I mean, you, it was an accident. You didn't do it on purpose. If you did, you'd be dead. <laughs> you didn't do it on purpose. You just, it's just an accident. <laughs> So when I went, I have a guy that goes all over the world looking for stuff for me. He said, she broke one of them. I said, yeah, but that's okay. He said, you're not mad? I said, no. Why should I be mad? You didn't do it on purpose. I said, it's just, it's just an accident. I said that to say that sometime you break something into Christianity, God's not mad at you. It just turned out to be an accident. So repent of it and go on. You sure you're not mad? I said, no, I'm not mad. I'm mad. She said, what about if it had been them big mice? I said, I'd have been mad. <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite there yet. I found these things. They were behind glass for 100 years. That's why they're perfect. And I invested in them. <laughs> now I'm bragging on that, but I thought, and what makes it nice is precious because it's rare. Right. And rare brings a price to something. That's what commitment and trust is. Let me just say this and I'll close. If you're committed, your Christianity is a transmitted instinct. You have an instinct about what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and how to do it. If you are committed, that's why Paul is talking to him. Be committed. You have a transmitted instinct. People will notice it before you get there. It goes before you and leaves a trail behind you. And all of a sudden people begin to say that, I want to be like that lady. I want to be like that man. Man, I, I want to live for God like that. You see, why? Because they fight the good fight of faith. They lay hold on eternity, uh, on eternal life, and then they're committed. He said, keep what has been committed to your trust. Well, Jesus committed his blood to us, his grace to us. So we don't get stupid with it. His love, his nine fruits, his nine gifts, fullness of the Godhead bodily. Genesis to Revelations. Holy Ghost living inside of you. Good God, man. Access to the very throne of the Most High God. Whew, all these wonderful things. But you can't play loose with them. Because they're holy. I'll say this in close. Very few people. Mary, stand up. Mary, stand up. Mary's my executive secretary. In other words, to get to me, you got to get to her. All right? <laughs> That's all. She calls my office the holies of holies. You can't go in there unless you got a rope around your ankle just in case you're saying you're going to die. <laughs> you know, she don't let nobody in there. Yeah, yeah, unless I tell her to. 
And, uh, and they said, uh, uh, uh. And, and it's a beautiful office too. I mean, I, I, decor I even decorated the thing myself. I thought I'm doing pretty good. Kathy taught me some good stuff. And, uh, but they watch over that. Not that it's um, better than anybody. I don't think it is. It's, uh, it's just precious. Yeah. It's where me and God meet. It's not the stuff I got inside of it. Did y'all see the rebuttal that I did on Facebook about all this stuff about the, uh, some of y'all went to my uh, 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 Facebook when they were attacking me about this plane. I decided to do it. You saw it? You know, one lady wrote it. She says, well, what did you think? Did you believe what he said? She says, i tell you the truth. I don't remember what he said. I was looking at all the beautiful furniture that he had in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I can't win for losing. For God's sake, man. I'm not thinking about it. But you know, Kathy thought that. She said, you know, and I said, I don't mind people saying that's not the issue. Because you didn't pay for it. I didn't take your money. I don't do those things. You know, I'm a man of integrity. I am. If I'm doing something wrong, I don't know I am. I said, well, I got lawyers. I got all kinds of lawyers. And my tax lawyer, I said, you better make sure this right. He's Jewish. I said, oh, I ain't going to let you go in the rapture. <laughs> he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> I give him a hard time. He's such a blessing. You know? I said, I'm telling you. Because he does... I, I hire people on things I don't know about. You see, I hire to my weaknesses. I don't hire to my strengths. I want somebody telling me what to do. Now, if you want to be a good CEO, hire to your weaknesses. You don't have to be the smartest man in the room. Hire to your weaknesses. And then I realized this, that Jesse Duplantis Ministries employees are far bigger than Jesse Duplantis. I'm going to deal with that one of the things. It's going to shock you. And I, I, I'm going to need Tony. I, I, I'm, I'm going to need Tony if you come to one of these, if you can't, because I'm going to use Tony as an example, because Tony's a big man. Tony is one of the most precious men I've met in my life, and he serves K Kathy, uh, Carolyn, and Jerry. And, uh, and if, if he can, I, I want to do that. And I'll show you something. You'll never forget it. I did it to my staff. They all went crazy. They went, good God. Oh, man, it'll show you God's place. It'll show you some things. You see, because you, because you need to know these things. It's a, in fact, you need to get beyond believing. Quit saying, I believe, 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 believe. Say, I know in whom I have believed. I know. Now, that brings confidence and assurance. And God's word will work for you. I'm Jesse Duplantis, and I approve this message. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand clap for that. <laughs>